Hello, everyone. All right, we're going to get started. All right, so I'm um, Zachary Fing, ZBF Geothermal and uh, NIGEO board member. This is a panel on financing commercial ground source heat pump projects. Um, and I have three great panelists with me. I have Sam from Settlement Housing Fund. Um, SHF is in the process of, you know, designing and underwriting their first geothermal project right now. So Sam can talk a little bit about, you know, what that looks like from a developer perspective, all the things that he wish he knew up front. You know, <laughs> that might be a conversation for later. Um, but no, you, you know, I always think that it's great to get some real world experience, not just saying, you know, someone up here saying, hey, we have some great programs available and this is how we use them. But someone that's actually living it and thinking through like, how does it come together? How to, you know, and how does it come together for an affordable housing deal? which is the bulk of the projects going on in New York City right now. Um, then we have Caitlin with the New York Green Bank um, talking about some of the Green Bank programs. I have to say, in my pre-call with Caitlin, I learned a ton about programs that I never knew existed, so that is great. Um, and then I have Irani with uh, New, York uh, New York City EEC talking about um, their programs and New York City kind of Pacific stuff. So I'll let each of them introduce themselves, and then we'll get started. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Sam Birnbaum. <clears throat> Great to be here. Thank you, Zach. Uh, I'm a senior project manager at Settlement Housing Fund. Um, Settlement is a 54-year-old not-for-profit organization. We're based in New York City, and we build and rehabilitate affordable housing uh, in three of five boroughs right now, about to very likely expanding to four. Um, Zach and I are working on, as he mentioned, a project we have in Coney Island. Settlement purchased this property in 2023, in April, and we are currently in pre-development, projecting to close on our construction financing in, um, in June of 2025. Um, we've had a lot of learnings go into it from um, how geothermal works with low-income housing tax credits to utilizing investment tax credits, working with syndicators and lenders on pricing these financial instruments, uh, and just making sure that this project goes smoothly, given the fact that it includes a fairly complicated system, at least much more complicated than we're used to installing. So look forward to any questions, and uh, thank you for, being, for letting me be here. Thanks, Sam. Great, thank you so much, and it's great to be here, everyone. I'm Caitlin Butler with the New York Green Bank, and we are a division of NYSERDA, so you've heard a lot from my colleagues who offer incentives and other programs to help uh, manage your project costs. We offer loans, so unfortunately not, not the free money over here, but that's okay, uh, because we have, we have quite a bit of it. Uh, and so the New York Green Bank started off with a billion dollars of ratepayer capital in order to lend to close financing gaps. Am I echoing all over the room? Can so, oh. We got a yes and a no? All right, all right. All right, well, uh, is what it is. So I'll share that from a New York Green Bank perspective, we're here to act like a lender when you're not able to get a lender but you should be able to get one because you're building something that is sustainable and credit worthy as long as you get creative in line with the state's mandate. So what does that mean, long story short, for geo and for buildings that are high performance? We can lend to those projects in line with the state's guidelines and there are two ways we could do so. One is a flexible lending program. So if you come in and you need between about three to $5 million up to $50 million, that's the type of loan size we would work on for either your one project or a portfolio. And we could be anything from the pre-dev stage through construction, through construction to short term. Again, trying to figure out how to get creative to get you the capital that you need, but at market rates and market terms. On the other hand, we started a concessionary lending product last year where we lend at lower rates to organizations like CDFIs and specialty nonprofit lenders to try to give them sub-market rate capital. That's a little bit longer term, specifically for green buildings for disadvantaged communities in New York State. So I'll stop there and pass it over to Arangi, who uh, we've been able to work with on some transactions as well. Uh, so that'll be my last note, saying that we're flexible, whether we're participating, we're being one of your lenders, or we're doing the whole thing. Uh, excited to have this conversation about how we could get more geo out there. Thanks, Caitlin, and hello, everybody. 
My name is Irangi Dias. I'm a director of business development at NYSEEK. Uh, and at a high level, what we do is similar to um, what the New York Green Bank does. Uh, we lend to uh, clean energy and energy efficiency projects. So if a project saves greenhouse gases, then it is a project that we can uh, lend to. And geothermal certainly falls within that. We are pretty much sector agnostic, finance, uh, multifamily, commercial, industrial, etc. Um, in case you haven't heard of us, just for some quick context, uh, we were set up back in 2010 by the New York City Mayor's Office of Sustainability with the idea of being a green bank that would help the city green its buildings. Um, since then, we've expanded to have a larger geographic footprint than just New York City. Um, our official geographic footprint is now from Maryland to Massachusetts and DC. We also have a lot of other green bank lending partners in different parts of the country, and certainly New York Green Bank is one of them. Um, uh, in terms of our products, so we finance the pre-construction, construction, and post-construction phases. Our borrowers fall into two main buckets. It's either the entity that's, in this case, owning the geothermal system, or it could also be a developer that it has entered into a contract with the beneficiary of the geothermal system. Um, so it w our loans could look like loans directly to a borrower. Um, uh, that can happen at the initial stage, and that takes the form of pre-development loans. In fact, we were lucky enough to provide a settlement housing with the pre-development loan for uh, the Coney Island project, which um, has a possibility of including a geothermal component, as I understand. Um, and our pre-development loan would finance the sort of geotechnical survey, amongst other things. Uh, we also do acquisition loans, uh, as well as incentive bridging loans. Um, in addition, and sp specifically for developers on the developer side, we can finance energy services agreement contracts as well as power purchase agreement contracts. And I think in, in the case of geothermal, a power purchase agreement is, is more applicable, um, but that is a situation where we would be lending to the developer um, as opposed to the um, beneficiary of the geothermal system. Um, so I'm sure we'll have more questions, but for now, I'll kind of leave it there. Um, great to be here and to see you all. Perfect. Thanks. So I think let's start kind of at the beginning of a project. So, you know, you, um, I think all of you have mentioned, you know, the pre-development funding, um, which is a critically important piece of a project. You know, there's a, typically a soft cost budget on a project, and typically geothermal is not thought of in the initial inception of a project. Um, you know, it might be just starting to be developed right now. But more and more, you know, it's, you know, we're seeing projects as light as 100% construction drawings changing to geothermal, which is crazy if you think about it. You know, doing a full redesign of your entire project as someone told you to. But as a lender, my heart just. <laughs> that's a project that actually your friends are in Connecticut, Connecticut Green Bank. Uh, we have a project in Connecticut that um, because of, and we'll, we'll get to this in a second, but because you can stack low income housing tax credits and the Inflation Reduction Act tax credits, geothermal became the VE, which means the state needed to give less subsidy to the project. So when they did their final pricing review at 100% CD, they needed to get a waiver, and they required the developer to redesign to geothermal, which is all the, so now you have an unbudgeted consultant, me, uh, <laughs> you have a change order on the architect, the mechanical engineer, you're doing a test geothermal borehole and thermal conductivity test, and you need to fund this somehow. And either it's developer equity if they're a large enough developer or to get some sort of, you know, capital. So just, you know, and maybe, get, you know, get your opinion of all of, you know, all three of you. But, you know, what does that look like? You know, how painful of a process is it? You know, is it only the large institutional developers that can, that can get it? Is it the smaller first-time developers? You know, who can access some of that pre-development funds? And, you know, I, to me, I think this is a critically important piece, especially for low income where the developers at construction loan close are typically reimbursed for their soft costs that they've paid out. So they're all either on equity or financing the project until it hits that. And, you know, that could be, you know, five to 10% of a project cost. So, you know, you get a 50 or $100 million project. It's a lot of money to lay out for small developers. Brilliant. Okay, thank you. Um, right, so pre-development loans is a product category uh, in our sort of suite of products that we offer that's, I think, been really growing uh, in level of interest uh, 
just across the board in, in all technologies that we finance, clean energy and energy efficiency. And so I think that's just an indication of how important it is uh, for the market. Because, yes, I mean, at the pre-development stage, we're talking um, about you know, really early stage projects. There's, there's very little, uh, basically nothing in terms of collateral that I guess more traditional lending typically requires, right? So we're kind of going in with, with an ask for a lot of funds without anything, any specific deliverable that's tangible uh, on there. And so from our perspective, uh, we think it's really an area where we want to provide support because there is a need. Um, as long as there is a clear takeout and we're comfortable with what that takeout will be. And what I mean by takeout is how will our loan get paid back? The answer is typically whichever source of construction funding comes in. And sometimes that could be NYSEEC because we do pre-construction, construction and post-construction. But we would need to understand what the, the nature of that takeout financing is going to be. And then, of course, um, I mean, at NYSEEC, we are a mission-based lender. We, we want to make sure that if we are providing a loan, um, the, the, the associated expenses are related to uh, something that would provide an environmental benefit, because that is our mission. So I would say those, those are the two main um, things that we look for when, when we're looking at providing pre-dev loans. Thank you. Uh, we would be in a similar boat, and I guess to consider who is a good fit for this? At the end of the day, I'd, um, you know, I think of it as a loan and us answering that question, how are we going to be repaid? So you've laid out one clear repayment plan, but then if the developer has, does not have the ability to guarantee some asset, some aspect of the loan, some part of the collateral or the piece of debt, that, that could be a challenge. Like if you're a developer who's new, but you have some projects, you have some assets somewhere, you've done some work, that could be helpful because we wanna see, okay, what's your track record? What's your likelihood of getting that takeout? And what's your ability to pay if that doesn't come through? Because you're right, at the end of the day, we can't, you know, we could step in and claim your geothermal study, but that's not collateral that we're, we're seeking. I'd share though that if you're considering whether this is a good fit, um, in a time crunch like the type that you mentioned, it, it might be or it might not be because our value is that we're here to try to get to the bottom of this and figure if we can sort of squeeze in this leverage that you need, but that does involve diligencing your business and trying to understand what the likelihood is of repayment. So it could be, as you're sharing, maybe one of the only options at that early stage, uh, but it's one that's gonna require us, You know, it's, it's not like a simple credit score into a form click. Uh, it's understanding the project, understanding you. And just one other thought for you, we have also done lending against NYSERDA and utility incentives, which could provide upfront collateral for you all that makes it a little bit easier to get a project done. So whether it's the building owner that's receiving that or the developer or tradesperson, We've done transactions before where we say, okay, well, that's a contract that's pretty easy to understand. Like we trust that it's gonna be funded, we can diligence it, and we can lend you a certain percentage of that up front. And then the only collateral that we need is that contract. So that could be one way to be a little creative about how to get earlier stage capital. Just out of curiosity, I, I don't really know who's in the room. So can if you're with, let's say, a real estate developer or a property owner, can you raise your hand? So we have a few, and then policy maker. Okay, and then we'll say industry. Okay, so kind of all over the place. Okay, great. And you have a few utilities here as well. And utilities, okay, great. So if to try to answer Zach's question, um, we'll say hopefully in a useful way, it's uh, maybe I can say why and how we chose Geothermal for this project. Again, Settlement Housing Fund, we're a nonprofit developer, <coughs> and, um, we, we own about 3,000 units of housing, all income restricted. We do um, a lot of work with formerly homeless households. Um, so we do typically a very large set aside for, um, for you know, folks leaving shelters. And um, a lot of our work, um, well, really all of our work is income restricted. So how do we choose geothermal in an environment where we're serving people that really aren't going to pay a lot in rent? Well, there's really two things we think about. Um, one is narrative. 
The other is cost. And when I say cost, I'm talking about construction costs as well as operating costs. So in this pre-development phase, we're thinking about what the landscape is of available funding. Unfortunately, I think probably everyone here knows the best word to characterize public funding is scarcity. There's really just not a lot out there. And unfortunately, to make these projects financially viable, you have to get public money, low or zero interest debt, to build your, build your building uh, and also to sustain operations. So with that in mind, we, th we start thinking about narrative. Organizations like mine tend to have to apply for you know, competitive funding streams in order to build these projects. And how can we put together a competitive application? In many cases, it's doing things that are interesting, doing things that are impactful, being able to write a narrative for some funding application that shows, hey, look at this thing that we're doing. This is why this is a positive. This is why it's good for the world. So you know, for all the geothermal installers in the room, during a pre-development phase, one of the most helpful things you can do for a developer is help us with that narrative have some sort of prepackaged information with you know, uh, estimates of you know, utility cost savings and easy to understand language translating the technical details of a geothermal project so we can include that in our applications. Um, you know, information that we can share with you know, uh, neighbors and residents of the building who might be afraid or, not, or sort of not understand what a geothermal system looks like. So that's the narrative side. On the cost side, again, we're talking construction costs and we're talking operational costs. Zach mentioned the pre-development period. Again, looking for sources of money to make these projects a reality, we look at you know, funders like NYSEQ, who thank you so much for the amazing interest rate, we really appreciate it. Um, but again, it's, we're looking for low interest, or in many cases, zero interest loans um, to make these projects viable. So thanks. Um, the other thing that I will say is we are seeing a shift I don't know how I feel about this as a consultant, where some of our developers are asking us to defer a portion of our fee until project close. We'll talk. I always hate saying this, because then everyone in the room goes, hey, why'd you offer that to someone else and not me? <laughs> but no, um, we are seeing that, you know, we're seeing that, you know, you know, um, some of these soft costs are, you know, in terms of like, Con Ed, in terms of test loop, you know, Con Ed has a program in New York City that will pay you know half the cost up to forty thousand dollars of a test loop, and that can come directly to us, so that you know there's not the reimbursement time frame. Um, one of the gaps in just getting incentives funded right now, um, or to be able to do you know short-term financing against it, is the timing of when you get that incentive in terms of you know information required. You you typically can't get a utility incentive offer letter until after you have a design, um, minor detail. Um, I keep pushing back and saying, do I really need a design? Like, we know how many apartments it is and everything else. But it, until you get an offer letter, it's very tough to include in a capital stack. So, unfortunately, we're seeing, you know, a lot of our developers either not underwrite around utility incentives or underwrite at, you know, a 30 or 50 percent probability. And they might have three or four discretionary sources of funding. And if they, you know, they put a 50 percent likelihood and one of them falls out, you know, it still makes the, you know, the cap stack whole. Um, so just, it, just something to flag that, you know, it is a gap that we see in the marketplace. Um, I don't have a great answer for it. Uh, we work with their utility partners throughout the state, you know, and other states, you know, on a daily basis to try to come up with options, you know, around that. Um, and it's just one of those facts of life right now as we, yeah. Yeah, just a real, there's like a, a very specific example that of, of this exact problem that we are, my this project that I'm working on is experienced. We were actually originally projected to close in December of this year. And we were sort of communicating with HPD, Department of Housing Preservation and Development, the Housing Development Corporation about this timeline. And one of the unfortunate truths of our capital stack is that there is a fair amount of uncommitted money in that stack. And um, ultimately, a variety of things happened, but ultimately we were pushed to June of next year in part because this fun this money wasn't certain. Um, some of that money is incentive money. Um, other pots of money we actually didn't even include in our underwriting because it was too uncertain. For example, the clean heat program is not even part of our underwriting because it's it's not guaranteed that we get it. And the real world impact of this is that the project doesn't happen, right? We It's six months delayed in this case. Uh, I hate to use the word delayed. It's 
the, the schedule has moved by six months. So there are real cost implications. The whole project gets more expensive. We have outstanding an outstanding pre-development loan that's just going to accrue more interest, and that's a real that's a, a real amount of money that has to get paid. So if there are any products out there that can be committed to earlier in the process, um, you know, it's extremely helpful in a really tangible way. Uh, it, it overall will reduce the, at least for affordable projects, reduce the, um, the amount of un uncertainty in our capital stack will make these projects happen faster and ultimately, hypothetically, free up more public money that otherwise will have to pay for our delays um, to, you know, fund additional projects to make more geo happen in the city. I just want to make, make a point, I meant it, mentioned it earlier also, but we, we do have an incentive bridge product. Um, and in some cases, incentives come really quickly. I think especially maybe where it's sort of just a prescribed measure and it's sort of a um, certain amount per, per, per term or whatever, and it's, it's pretty short, the, the time span between putting, you know, needing to do the installation and getting the incentive. But I think in some cases, it can take a long time especially when there is an MNV period involved. Um, and so, so at NYSEEC, we, we have this product where we put out the funds basically prior to installation. So installation could be funded with our loan. And then once uh, the sort of incentive check comes in, uh, we have many different sort of scenarios in, in which it can, it can come in. And one of them is that the check comes to us. Um, as a lender, we sort of take our portion, and then if there is any you know, remainder or excess, we, we send it back to our borrower. Um, but yeah. that's, that's a way to kind of deal with working capital constraints, which are a big problem uh, for, for developers. To, to, in order to get that bridge loan, though, you need some sort of offer letter or some sort of, you know, certainty from the utility or the incentive provider that it's going to come, right? Yes. Oh. I mean, w you're right. We right. can't just uh, provide a loan based on, you know, I can't uh, send a, you a, a single conversation. That, that would uh, not work. I, I can't uh, send you a 64-page program manual and say my math says it no, should get this, unfortunately. No. no, no. no. All right. Um, just by a show. Please don't. <laughs> don't. All right. Um, so just by a show of hands, how many people are familiar with kind of how the New York State clean heat incentives work? As a, all right. So it, it, it's fewer than most. So I'll go over this very quickly. Um, the incentives, you know, depending where you are, are, you know, for large commercial projects and multifamily, are savings driven. So you get a lot of the savings from fuel switching. So you go from an 80% or 90% efficient code compliant boiler to a geothermal system with a COP of three. So you have a, you know, 80% reduction in carbon emissions and that reduces your MMBTU. So instead of a thousand, you have 800, you have 200 MMBTUs, you have 800 MMBTUs of savings, and then there's a conversion rate. The problem is you need to get far enough in design that you know what is the building envelope so is a passive house? Well, depending on which passive house program you're on, if you go FIA, Sophia, you may or may not need triple pane windows. That's a 10% difference in energy savings right there. Um, and so there's a host of these design decisions. Are you doing, what does the building look like from a conversion? Are you doing four pipe fan coils? Are you doing two pipe fan coils? Are you doing vertical stack heat pumps? Are you doing horizontal heat pumps? And there could be a 15, 20% efficiency difference there. So you can get a rough estimate that's, you know, plus minus 50%, you know, maybe a little bit closer, plus minus 30%, because most of the incentive comes from the fact that you're fuel switching. But it's very tough to actually know exactly what that incentive is. And then I need enough of a design that we can take that, Ryan, a savings calculation. New York State has a clean heat savings calculator, so you can put the baseline building load and the new building load in and AHRI certificates and it spits out kind of savings. Or then there's a full energy model approach where you, where you model both buildings and you break apart each savings. Typically, you need to be about the 50% CD phase in order to do that, which is probably about two months prior to close. So, um, and then, not for nothing, I am putting, so this package now took us six months to put together. I'm now sending that to the utilities, saying, can I get an offer letter tomorrow? And then following up buying a text, email, phone call, all in about 15 minutes of each other. No, joking. Sorry, guys, <laughs> for the utilities in the room. But no, so the challenge is, you know, a lot of times that offer letter won't actually come in until post-construction loan close. So it's not in the capital stack because, you know, it's received late in the project. Now, by that point, it's really tough to get off of a geothermal system. It's designed, to, you know, the project is designed around implementing that system. That's your building mechanicals, that's your energy savings, O&M model underwriting to change. 
would be probably a six month redesign at that point. So you're committed to do it by, you know, the in utility incentives, which are meaningful. Like it's very likely this project in Coney Island will hit the million dollar Con Ed cap on it. 179 apartments. So, you know, a little over 200,000 square feet. So it's a decent sized project. Um, sorry, 133,000 square feet. We're just going to make the building bigger and add density and units. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Instead of, uh, you know, it's, anyway, it will now be the you know, 40-story building in Coney Island by the time I'm done with it at the end of this presentation. <laughs> I will inform the architect so Sam doesn't get killed. No. Uh, but anyway, so the, you, you know, and then, you know, where New York State is in the program right now is utilities can only issue offer letters for projects to end of 2025. So it would have been very ambitious, if not impossible, for a project closing in December to have a system that would meet the utility definition of in-service by the end of you know, 2025. With a June close, it's impossible. So now we need to wait for you know, what the new program is. There, you know, it's very likely there'll be an extension, but we don't know what that conversion rate is. So it's the uncertainty of not knowing what the incentive rate is, plus the uncertainty of not knowing when you get that offer letter that makes it so difficult to underwrite around incentives. So that's not saying incentives are not meaningful, they are. They get taken into account kind of as a back-end conversation. A lot of times, um, the unfortunate nature of geothermal project is there's contingencies that are not considered, um, both on the development soft cost and construction cost side, that you know, a lot of GCs in New York City are really good at building VRF and vertical stack heat pump jobs, but they don't know as much about building geothermal. So there's some oopses and surprises and you know, what happens type deal. So the money ends up getting used on the project. It just doesn't end up getting used on that initial first cost in the capital stack. I guess I would add in stepping back, we've gone through a few different scenarios, like the scenario in which the design changes halfway through and takes six months to finalize, where you're starting up front knowing you wanna do affordable, high performing buildings. And so I think you're right, Zach, there are a lot of things that could happen. But stepping back, what could you or a developer that you're working with do at the outset? Try to have that plan, knowing that it's all an estimate, right? And if you're looking ahead, then if you're talking to a lender that will entertain trying to do pre-development, um, which we would, we're going to need to understand kind of hopefully a handful of things to get you a loan that doesn't rest on this incentive amount. Um, and that is basically us knowing, are you meeting NYSERDA's, which is the state's guidelines with your building for energy efficiency? Because that's what we need. We're actually not, I won't read your program manual. We're not going to the MMBTU level. We're saying, if it's a new building, does it exclude fossil fuels? Unless there's a backup. You know, In the pre-dev stage, there's a lot that could be determined. But as long as the lender that's aligned towards whatever our sustainability guideline is knows that you're going to hit it, whether you beat it by a mile or you beat it by a few feet, that's great because now we can talk about the project and see if we can get there. On the incentive bridge side, I totally agree. If we're going to lend to that, we're going to help you pull the money forward, but it might be a bit of a headache, you're saying, if you're deep amid the pre-dev process, just going for this utility incentive. I'll share, though, that a product that we've done before is looking outside just the geo incentives and so looking at, say, low carbon pathways. If you're building multifamily, if you're looking at a building that's putting EV charging on there, that's another incentive program. So if you're able to start early and look at what incentives in totality are on the building, if it's a building asset, then there could be a facility that says, okay, those come in at different times, there's different credit risk, and we can do one loan facility for you that, as you shared, gives you a certain amount of that money now, and then depending on how you need it to be, maybe we size it so that that incentive also covers your interest reserve, right? So we're all paid out of the incentive. Maybe we're doing um, different flexibility around when we are repaid over the availability period to account for that. Uh, incentive financing and pre-development financing could be separate or could be kind of flexible, I guess, based on your building project. But you're right. It's, it's going to be a guessing game up front while you're still hammering down the design on the actual incentive side. And we'd like to help anyway as long as you're meeting our guidelines. I appreciate it. So um, 
I want to segue a little bit to kind of low income housing tax credits and IRA and kind of how they stack, if you don't mind. And just so to me, this is kind of the secret sauce about why any 40 plus unit, you know, affordable housing project, GeoFummel typically comes in cost neutral or cost positive. So cheapest first cost on one of these projects. Um, and it's because of the change in the provision under the IRA that allows the stacking. Yeah. Um, so this is the meat and potatoes for us. Um, just to do a little bit more audience participation, how many people in the room are just generally familiar with low income housing tax credits? Okay, so not that many. So the crash course is basically, uh, these are when you build a building, um, and you're at least I'll say it from, you know, the affordable point of view, you're building an affordable building, you're typically getting a low or zero interest loan from um, a city entity. Um, in this case, we're working with two, it's the Department of Housing, uh, or excuse me, the Housing Development Corporation and the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, HDC, the first one I mentioned, um, will provide under what's called their ELLA program, extremely low and, I can't remember the name, low income and for low, limited affordability, affordability, I can't remember the name. In any event, they provide this zero or low interest loan and as of right, with that loan, you get these tax credits, low income housing tax credits. As a not-for-profit, we don't have any use for tax credits because we aren't taxed. We're a nonprofit. At the same time, what we can do is we can sell these tax credits to an investor who then can utilize them. They utilize the credits, and they also buy, as part of the transaction, the, depre the building's depreciation. So we size these credits. These credits are sized. They, how, how valuable they are based on two things. First of all, what is it that you are actually, what is your actual construction budget? Um, and your soft cost budget, and then what is the price that you are actually getting for each dollar of credit? So let's take a building, you to, the building costs a million dollars, and let's say you have half a million dollars of soft costs, so $1.5 million total. If you have a 4% low income housing tax credit, which is one of the kinds of tax credits, you're essentially, I'm painting with a broad brush, but multiplying that number by 4%, and then multiplying it again by the value of the credit itself. The value of the credit is determined by the market. You go around to different investors and you say, here's a dollar of tax credit, what will you give it? Give me for it? Some will give you less than a dollar. Interestingly enough, some will actually give you more than a dollar. So this is the primary vehicle through which affordable housing in the United States is funded. It's these tax credits. Now, for the Coney Landing deal, that what we're working on with Zach, this building is generating about 55 to $60 million in tax credit equity. So that's, we're building this building. It's, we get these credits and we're gonna sell them to an investor for 50, between 55 and $60 million. On top of that, we are leveraging what's called an investment tax credit. We're actually doing two kinds of investment tax credits. One is a geothermal investment tax credit and one is a solar investment tax credit. I think it's section 42 of the IRS code. Um, these tax credits work very similarly um, to the um, to the, the low income housing tax credits. Essentially, you're building something. In this case, a solar, uh, a, a photovoltaic system, as well as in our case, a, a geothermal system. You are taking the cost, the eligible costs of that system. So you know the IRS says these certain costs are eligible for a tax credit. These are these other ones are not. Then you're multiplying against that number whatever an investor will give you for each dollar of credit. For our Coney Island project, we are generating, as I said, between 55 and $60 million of low-income housing tax credits, and then about $3.5 million worth of solar and investment tax credits. One other nice thing, and just for, for context, I think the project is about a $130 million project. So that is a large chunk of the funding of the project. Um, one nice thing, a, a change that the IRS made recently is um, you used to have to if you have low income housing tax credits and you also do investment tax credits, you used to have to subtract the amount that you're getting on your investment tax credit from your low income housing tax credit. So if you get $50 million in equity from your low income housing tax credit or basis, then you have to subtract whatever the cost is, the, the basis cost is of your geothermal equipment from that. And it basically nets out. You now no longer need to do that, so you're basically allowed to double dip. So my geothermal equipment in this building is generating equity from the low-income housing tax credit side as well as from the investment tax credit side. So all in all, this isn't a cost-neutral system for us, but it's not that far away. Uh, and there are certain things that can happen that will actually get us pretty even closer. Um, the investment tax credit, it 
comes in tiers. So at the as of right credit, I can't remember. Do you want me to explain? It's a six percent as of right credit, and then it goes up from there based on certain eligibility criteria. Um, from um, you know producing under one megawatt uh, of generation capacity to um, doing it in what's called an energy community. It's basically if your project is geographically located in a place that had lots of oil and gas employment in the past. There's an adder for domestic content production. So if your system, you're sourcing at least, I think, 80%. 40%. 40%. Thank you, Zach. If you're sourcing 40% uh, of your your uh, your equipment domestically, it's another 10% credit. So if you stack all these credits on top of each other, the maximum it could, it could be is a 70% credit, which is absolutely ridiculous. Um, so if you have a, if your geothermal system costs $100, then you get $70 off. Ours is underwritten at a 30% credit, but I think that there's a good chance we get to 40 um, with Zach's help doing a domestic adder, um, the, the domestic content production one. Um, but all this is the same sort of rambling here, but all this is to say that there are some really valuable incentives that make these, these are really make or break, um, you know, for, for a system like this. We can't just walk up to a city agency and say, hey, listen, you're giving us, you know, $50 million. We want you to give us more to do a project that includes geothermal. And they're saying, well, no, that we don't have enough money. We have to go out and find these programs um, to basically make this work and to make the city willing to finance the project. So, yes. So, so I said this earlier on my, you know, on the morning panel that I, no one ever told me to be a geothermal consultant. I also needed to be a tax equity, you know, advisor and, you know, sometimes therapist and, you know, all the other roles of, you know, developers going, I'm really doing this, huh? But no, um, the, you know, when you combine the low-income housing tax credits with the geothermal ITCs, depending on your sale rate, you're ending up somewhere in that 65 to 80% range of total subsidy on a project of the geothermal system ITC basis. Um, I'm not going to cover ITC basis here. There were, you know, some IRA implementation panels earlier today. Um, but just say that depending on who you hire for the accounting side, um, it's somewhere between all and none of the expenses you would think would are eligible. And I'll leave it at that. Uh, say, Sam's living that a little bit right now of every day, you know. And part of the thing is that, you know, at the end of the day, the tax credits get sold. So the investor needs to be comfortable with their buying. So there's cost segregation studies that are done to allow them to, you know, make sure that they can defend their investment. Yeah, I, I would just, I'll close with just saying that there's, I think from my point of view, still a surprising amount of, there's still a surprising lack of fluency about how all of this works um, from a tax perspective, tax and accounting perspective. You know, we have our, we use these sort of major accounting firms, major law firms that you kind of go in expecting them to know what they're doing. And this is still new enough that they, in many cases, don't. And they're sort of figuring it out on the fly. Um, and that's complicated, figuring out every, every piece of this for, you know, three and a half million dollars worth of equity on a $130 million deal. It starts sometimes feeling like it's not worth it. Um, the nice thing is that this will get easier. Um, the IRS will continue to issue guidance that clarifies the rules. Um, the accountancies will get better at doing this. They'll understand what the process is. Tax credit syndicators will get a better sense of what the market is. Um, your term sheets will, you know, have stock language in them rather than need, needing to create them from scratch. So this is getting easier. But um, I actually think there's a real opportunity for installers to do like what Zach does and basically come in with a full service operation where Zach isn't just installing it. He's helping us translate this system so it's digestible for the accountants, for the lawyers, for the city. It's, it's, and it's really necessary without that kind of support at this moment. I don't know if this would really be possible for, for organizations like mine. And I, and I will say, I got earlier today, I haven't read it yet, but from one of our, one of our affordable deals, a standard geothermal tax credit sale term sheet. I had yet to see this. So, but, you know, it's a developer, it's a syndicator that has bought some in the past um, and has actually developed a standard form. Um, I, I'll report back later if I like it or not. But, you, but at least, you know, they've done enough. They've seen the market opportunity and the need. And that's going to make it significantly easier to underwrite. Um, and it's going to save a ton of agony and time and legal fees and accounting fees and brain capacity. And at the end of the day, there's only so much development time and capacity 
So unfortunately, sometimes things fall out because there's not enough bandwidth, unfortunately. Can I give you one more tax moment, a riveting topic? Um, because the new, like previously ITC has been well known in the tax equity markets for things like solar. And so with the IRA expanding it to a new construct like geothermal, including now for the first time, not just an energy asset, but the interdependent parts of the building can all be counted towards a tax credit. That is very exciting. Um, and there is still so much to learn as these two have highlighted very well, I do think it could seem overwhelming. One really easy way to consider seeing for yourself, okay, if I do all this work to get $1, like on every $1 of geothermal tax credit I get, how much am I gonna see of that? How much of that's gonna go to the project? You could look at different brokers that are now in the market um, I'll name at least two Crux and Common Forge that publish information or are open to having discussions on different types of tax credits. And you could see, okay, oh, they've sold a $4 million tax credit, or oh, I don't see any geo tax credits of this size. Um, maybe I should just reach out to them and see what the market is, because they're just buying and selling. They'll publish some free information, and that could help you make an informed decision. Look, is this something I want to go into? Uh, because there are going to be costs. Uh, from the you know finance side, you're going to probably want insurance. It's a new type of tax credit. Um, is the IRS going to claw it back? You know, there's if, if we go into all the esoteric questions, I'll, <laughs> I'll be kicked off. So I think it'd be good to consider for yourself. Okay, how much money really does come back to me net uh, for every dollar of credit? And there could be, especially for these large projects, like a lot of value where you might want to go down this path. And then you're going to find out that everyone is figuring it out as you go. Um, and maybe it does create an innovative opportunity that hasn't been seen before. And we'll lend against that. So one last wacky loan idea for you. We'll do tax credit. So there's something called a tax equity bridge loan that's been in the energy markets for a while. We would try to work out a bridge product to your tax credit for geothermal. Again, just trying to pull the money up front in the process. Um, I'll just say, you know, terms aren't standard for that. We haven't done that much. We're working on one now. Uh, being, you know, if you're going to go for this tax credit, you're already going to have the accountants lined up, someone to certify the value, maybe some insurance um, just in case that person is wrong. Uh, and lenders will want all of those things. Uh, to look at for a loan to give you some of that capital up front. Yeah, and I will toss out that I think they're still here, uh, Basis Capital. Derek from Basis Capital was on our morning IRA implementation session, um, which is a similar company to Crux that, you know, is selling tax credits. They're working with us on, a, on one of the, actually, tax credits for one of the site tours earlier today. So, um, cool. So I think I'll open it up for, you know, a few questions. Um, yeah. No. They just have to yell really loudly. Who wants to go first? Who's still awake by a show of hands? <laughs> yeah. Yes. And there is coffee right after this. Hi there, Richard from Kenza Heat Pumps in the UK. It's fascinating just to try and compare and contrast the models and you know, the complexity of the subsidy regime here. When considering technology choices, and we are proponents of geothermal heat pumps, we manufacture some, but you know, the consideration in the UK with developers is often you know, just education around different forms of technology, so versus air source heat pumps and whatever else. I'm just wondering from a developer's perspective, you know, how you made that decision in the first place. Is it purely driven because the incentives are better for um, geothermal? And that seems to be the sense I'm getting from this conference or, you know, the technologically technology advancements and, and benefits. I'm just curious to get your views there. I wish I had a really concrete answer to that. I don't. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that settlement, just as an organization, prioritizes building sort of excellent places to live. Um, so we're always on the lookout for just what technology will help us get there. 
Um, I think it's attractive to just lower the operating cost of a building. So if you can, you know, realize a 15% UK utility cost saving over a passive house air source heat pump building, that's, we're going to look at that. Um, you know, there's lots of requirements um, pertaining to paying for tenants' utility costs. Uh, I think that's only growing. Um, right now, you're not required to pay for cooling, but that might happen. Um, and if there's opportunities to make it easier for the building to have a long life financially, I think we want to do that. I also think something we look at look at is um, f like trying to future proof the building. So, um, you know, if we're looking at like capital expenditures down the road, if you have a, a ground loop that's going to sit there and be totally fine for how long? 80 years? I mean, the pipe has a 50 year warranty, 50 year warranty. I mean, that's attractive. Um, having something that's in the ground that you really, I mean, not that you don't have to think about it, but you, you know, there's less to think about, I would say, um, long term. It's, you know, easier on the asset management side, uh, on the property management side. Um, you know, on the flip side, I do want to provide a couple caveats. One, I I'm, I'm sort of the biggest evangelist for how hard it is to manage buildings in New York City. Um, both for superintendents as well as asset management departments, and I think it's 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 there. It's sort of a ticking. I don't want to use the word bomb, but it's a ticking problem. We'll say that the city is levying increasingly stringent requirements for green technology when there's not, as far as I've seen, the uh, the um, the requisite amount of expertise on the operations side to actually make these systems function, to troubleshoot them, to you know, to replace them, to to operate them, to clean them. So, you know, we've thought a lot about what are we setting our property manager up for? We're saying, here's a geothermal building, and they say, what is that? We say, here's a passive house building, here are ERVs. They say, how do we service it? So it's it's not just here are all the benefits, and it's a green building, saving greenhouse gases, you know, cutting emissions and reducing utility costs, and, you know, the, you know, the system is of longer life. It's also the problem on the flip side of, are there the, is there the capacity, the, the fluency, the proficiency to actually function this product efficiently for a period of however many years? And right now, I would say, unfortunately, in most cases, I, said, I, I think the answer to that is no. So we're very focused. We're still in pre-development, but, you know, our, we have a 28-month construction period, and we will start recruiting a, and training a superintendent really far in advance of having this building start because there's a risk that we are going to really have to upskill them because there's just a shortage of skilled labor. And I hate to break it to Sam that he's going to train this superintendent and then they're going to quit 12 months later. Uh, I, I was just informed that as part of my contract, I am now training him. No. Uh, <laughs> We, we spend, to fill that gap, we spend a lot of time, you know, working with the supers on the onboarding. Um, I gave a presentation yesterday on, you know, commissioning and just, you know, operator training. So it'll be recorded. So anyone that didn't see it live yesterday, you know, can watch that. But one of the biggest things is, you know, we put building management systems and controls in. It sounds at an error code that says your building has self-destructed. Not that bad. But, you know, you have a low pressure alarm. Great. What does that mean? Who does that alarm go to? You know, if it goes to me, great. Am I the only one that got it? And what am I supposed to do about it? Is there a super on site that it went to? And then does it send out an error code that says your building has stopped self-destructing? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it has fixed itself. You know, so, you know, the worst thing as an industry that could happen is some of these early wave geothermal projects that are going on right now. Uh, as much as I want to, I hate saying we're early adopter phase for multifamily buildings, we are is for them to have problems and, you know, hopefully you never want it to fail, but even, you know, large problems, 311 complaints, lack of heat, lack of cooling will, you know, unfortunately set the industry back. Um, I just want to point out, especially because we are in the city of New York, that New York City has a free resource for buildings that sort of are asking these questions, like what technology sh should I use? What are the incentives available, et cetera? And it's great because there's someone from the New York City Accelerator, which is the name of the program right here. Laura, if you don't just raise, raise your hand, that's Laura. She works at the New York City Accelerator. If any of you have you know, projects in New York City, you're thinking of working in New York City, I would suggest uh, speaking with Laura. Um, the Accelerator is a great resource um, uh, for such questions. Hi, I'm Martha Sickles, um, Urbicon LLC. So I was just wondering, what kind of maintenance um, contracts, I mean, it, 
do you provide or do the developers provide on, on the geothermal and the kinds of warranties? So in this, so I own an installation business, light commercial. The deal I make with all our developers is I do not want to be the first service call. I do not want that 2 a.m. call. I will get it. But, you know, I don't, I don't want to, you know, service 179 apartments. But we will back stuff. Um, so I have service technicians. We have service trucks. So if, you know, a developer had an issue and the super couldn't figure it out or the installer couldn't figure it out, we would be there to help support them. Um, from a maintenance perspective, we try to design the systems as much as possible as set and forget. We don't want complex controls. You know, we don't want, you know, three-way valves that switch and do all this crazy stuff. And you need a computer science degree to figure out what's going on or an aerospace engineering degree to look at the mechanic room and say, this is what's going on. So the simpler we can keep the system, the better off we are. Um, a lot of times if we do BMS controls, they are really just sitting on top of it and doing a monitoring. We want more local controls, off the shelf parts, you know, to stock it. So from a maintenance perspective, water treatment, um, more and more of our projects, including this project, have a heat exchanger isolating the ground loop from the building side, which means that, I, you know, we've seen unfortunately some things and I can't give the supers, you know, any sort of, you know, you know, grief or complaints about it because they're doing the best they can. You know, maybe they didn't get correct training, maybe they're the new super, maybe they watched a YouTube video, you know, whatever happened, unfortunately. And, you know, they're going to a heat pump and they're airbounding it. But let's keep that airbound to the ground loop, not to the building side. So let's keep it on the building side, not the ground loop. So that heat exchanger protects us. You know, redundant pumps. Lead lag, so if a pump goes down, there's a standby pump ready to go. Um, and it switches over, it sounds an alarm, there's a contract, you know, or a phone number to call for a pump maintenance company that comes out, services it, gets it up and running. But if it takes a week, the building's still operating and you're not paying, you know, for a four-hour emergency service call at two o'clock in the morning. And there's anyone that has a service business that is always Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, New Year's Day, in the snowstorm, two feet of snow, the entire building's down. Like, it never happens on a, on a 60 degree, nice spring day when I'm already in Coney Island. <laughs> <laughs> it happens after I left Coney Island and I'm three hours away. But, you know, and then really the maintenance is change the air filters. As, you know, prevent stuff from getting into the system, protect the heat pumps to begin with. So regular filter changes. And from my experience, that's one of the hardest part of the jobs because it requires the supers getting physical access to 179 apartments multiple times a year. So you need residents to cooperate. Residents, you know, anytime... You know, you can lock a heat pump cabinet and make it tough for them to get in. Um, I was the worst, worst renter, I'll tell you. Um, I don't know if I ever told you the story. But um, my wife was doing residency in Jersey, and I, you know, unfortunately, I, had ha I apologize for any Jersey people here, but I had half an apartment in Jersey for three years of my life. And she rented this apartment that had, you know, an air conditioning unit in the closet and... You know, I opened the closet one day and there was mold growing on the ceiling. And I might be the worst person to get into an HVAC argument with. Uh, and they tell me that they fixed it, they painted it over. And then their solution to me not being able to see it was to lock the door. Challenge accepted. I bought a lock picking kit. <laughs> it was COVID times as well. This was 2020. I was bored. So me and my lock picking kit go, oh, look, there's still mold. Shocking sent them a photo. They told me that I shouldn't have seen it so they don't have to fix it. Um, but anyway, so anytime a tenant has physical access, whether it's behind a lock or not, when there's a will, there's a way. When there's too much time, you buy a lock picking kit. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> I do want to just mention on the maintenance side, I mean, again, we're thinking a lot about this. We're about three years, three and a half years away, but we're already thinking about it. Um, one thing that we're doing is in our maintenance and operating budget, we're putting an additional line for geothermal contract maintenance. Now, there's no question that this is going to be a fight with the city to for them to allow us to put this in there because they don't, I mean, the, you know, the more your expenses are, the lower your, you know, your, your senior debt can be. But we're, you know, we want this, we want this project to be successful. And we, again, given the sort of labor, skilled labor problems that I mentioned, we're not, we, we're going to push really hard to be able to have a dedicated line, line in our, in our maintenance budget you know, to fix these systems as our staff gets upskilled. I think we have time for one more question and then coffee break time. Uh, 
Hey everyone, uh, Ben Raff, New York Power Authority. Uh, just in the context of you know financing for larger commercial geothermal projects, you know I interact a lot with property managers, and you know they're not the ones that are financing projects; they're the ones pitching it to the people that are financing the projects. So I'm just kind of wondering, you know, with your differing perspectives, how to kind of talk to the pro the you know, the project manager from the facility side who would then be pitching to the financing people on, on their side and what kind of conversations I can bring to them to, I guess, make the case for geothermal on a, on a large campus basis. Yeah, thank you for asking that question. I think it's really, uh, it's an important one because we sometimes find that folks on the operation side of uh, buildings are very enthusiastic about you know, geothermal or really any other technology. They understand it, they're super excited. Um, but then the finance folks get involved. And, you know, I'm one myself, but they tend to be super analytical, looking at the numbers, and then that's where things sometimes sort of go awry. So you know, in our experience, I think it's great if the two parts of the organization, the operations folks and the finance folks, start speaking earlier and sort of come with a united front to a lender. Because we've sometimes had the operations folks come to us without really having their finance folks on board and, and things have, haven't gotten uh, gone so smoothly. Thank you. I would share it comes a little to having the narrative as Sam mentioned earlier. Like what What is the story from the ground? Oh, we're pursuing some improvements that should be lowering costs by changing our heating to a thermal solution through a geothermal loop. Um, that might be better than, oh, like, do you, are you comfortable with geothermal? Uh, but as far as, you know, moving beyond whatever narrative is to a conversation, I think these large um, developers and owners have banks they typically work with. So getting feedback from your already friendly, we hope, local lender could be a good first step. For us, we don't compete with private capital. So if your bank would do it, the reason we sort of don't give concessionary rates is we don't want to undercut them. We want the private markets to do this sort of work. But when you run into trouble, when they say, when they give you the reason that they can't or they won't or they won't even look at it, that gives you the opportunity to approach a NYSEEC, a green bank, or another type of alternative lender that might have that mission that includes geothermal, because now you've you've given you know, you've given them a chance, you've given a friendly lender that already has the diligence on your business, that knows how well your properties perform and how good of an operator you are, that opportunity to weigh in and tell you why. And it can be a no that can help you open another door, maybe. I would just say no one wants to be the first. They don't want to go first. It's too risky. There's too many unknowns. And it's just more of a hassle to do something that you've never done before versus taking a cookie cutter and you put it, do it here and here and here. So being able to come in with like precedence and, um, and not just saying, oh, there's another project that did this, actual hard numbers and a nice put, you know, make a nice PowerPoint slide or get a designer to make a PDF of three projects that did this before and you know, pretty graphics. I mean, that kind of stuff goes a long way, and it's it's that sort of subtle, we'll say pressure, subtle. I mean, it's it's influential. It's it's I don't want to say manipulative, but it is it helps grease the hinges a little bit to make it a little bit less scary, um, showing that this is this is something that's already been established. Um, it's not as scary as it might seem. It's not as complicated as it might seem. And, and just on that note, when we you know were underwriting one Java and working with the development team to pitch it to management. Um, Lend Lease Development's in a multinational company headquartered in Australia. No one on the US development team was willing to make the final buy-in decision. It went to the head of US devel of development. They said yes and said, send it to Australia. And Australia came back and said, what other tall buildings have this? And I then called every geothermal friend I had and then some. And because you know we're looking for 800 plus units, 35 plus stories. So we found a tower in South Korea, the Lone Tower. Um, and there was a serious conversation around, do we fly there to see this system operating? And it was kind of midway between the United States and Australia, so it worked out well. But there was like a good two week period where I was like going to my wife, maybe I have to go to Australia, you, may, uh, you know, South Korea next week. And she's just looking at me like I'm crazy. She's like, don't you own a New York City based business? 
<laughs> like, but you know, and, and luckily we were able to get around it and we got the investment buy-in and it, you know, going well and they're really happy they did it. And I can point to that as an example of who's done it and why it's not scary and you don't need to fly to, you know, <laughs> Korea anymore. But that's, you know, that's one of the stories of those examples that Sam mentioned to do that. So um, with that, our panel. I'm going to give of, you one, one other quick thing, but it's, it's in New York, not Korea. You could also share maybe in your back pocket all of the tax credit bridge lending. Oh, you know, this is now under the ITC from the keep that in your back pocket, perhaps. So as the property manager, you may not know what the numbers are going to be, but the finance person says, no, that's expensive. You say, oh, but you know, are you also in the tax credit business? And we have a bunch of incentives. Like, what if we spoke to New York State? What if we spoke to the city? And so having that narrative first, having a friendly relationship and having in your back pocket, you know, we're aware that there are many pools of capital that will give free money that can stack together. Um, would that be more interesting to you? Can get you some direction on where you can investigate and choose to pull in different advisors. Or you could go see the building on site in South Korea. Sounds pretty fun if someone will bankroll that trip for you. I'm telling you that, like, you know, an option. So anyway, I want to give a, a big thanks to, uh, you know, my panelists today. And, you know, thank you, everyone, for attending the conference. Thank you.